Welcome, my friends. Welcome to another aimless adventure coming to you from Newport, Ritchie, Florida. Today, we're at the 100th anniversary of the Chasco Fiesta, and Mr. Jim Sawgrass is going to present Native Southeastern history. I think it's time we explore more. Let's do it. So what do you say I start the show off by blowing me show? Don't let everybody over there know we're about to have a show. Want to hear it? Yeah. All right, the shows were used to communicate. Size of that, big enough for all of us to get inside of. 
your whole extended family would live in that one structure. In the summertime, the bottom would be left open to allow the fresh air inside. The hut roof would have walls on all sides, maybe a big roundhouse. Panics and lofts where people slept up above the bottom left open for a living area and work area. This hut that I'm pointing at is known as a chicky. That's a seminal word. Say that, chicky. That means house. Okay? This one you'll notice has a platform. Once they got moved deep into the Everglades, the platforms were very necessary because sometimes the swamp waters would rise right up into the hut. And so having a platform, you could pull a canoe right up next door to it, unload and sleep up in that house. Winter holes were a lot different than the summer holes. They were enclosed with walls. And what I'm pointing at here is a winter house that has a wall. We would make the wall of the house by weaving a basket like the fish trap over here made, or a giant basket for a wall, and then mud and clay would get plastered on and dry hard. And that's how made it to build a wall. And that was all over the eastern United States. In the northern part of the country, native tribes used uh, bark and grasses from the marshes to build the roofs and huts, their houses. But down here in the swamp, we would use something that was a little bit easier to get than bark off of the tree. In the Cherokee lands of Georgia, North Georgia and Alabama, up in the north here, they used the bark. There is no palm. But down here we have the palm. And everywhere the palms grow in the world, people would use that for the root of their hut. The palm was taken and used in roads, just like the one you see behind me there. And that's completely waterproof and done properly to last for a long time before it begins to leak. Nature gives us what we need. Down here we use the palm. Up north it was the bark. The bark could be made into many things besides just the root. How about a bucket made out of one piece of bark? There you go. Even the rope itself is made out of bark. The bark of the tree makes rope the inside bark is very stringy. We can also make rope with the moss you see hanging above you. This rope is made of Spanish moss. I can make it as long as I want by splicing and adding to it. This is what the moss looked like when it died. We would collect that, boil it in water to kill the red bugs, to kill the jiggers. Then it would be used for stuffing and mattresses. Some of the earliest automobiles had stuffing for the seats made of Florida's Spanish moss. That's true. Collected all over Florida. Moss. I guess back then they didn't know how to get the red bugs out, huh? Well, the natives did, and that's by boiling it. Once it's dry, very soft and fluffy. Imagine your bed being made of a buffalo hide with Spanish moss underneath it. That would keep you very warm. We also made our ropes with grasses, like palm, or in this case, everyone say yucca. The yucca grows in the woods around here. This is what it looks like all rolled up. It's got a sharp needle on the end. And actually, you can break that back and pull the string with it. You got yourself needle and thread. If you soak it in water and pound on it, you got yourself a lot of little strings. If you take when it's wet and twisted, now this is how the rope is begun. Okay? Once it's about that far down, we begin splicing, adding more string. When it's done, you got yourself some rope. Very strong rope. Help we made our fishing fishing nets. We would use the ropes like this. The duck is a very useful plant. The stem is what we would rub together for fire sticks. Rubbing sticks together to make fire. Yucca, one of the best sticks there is in the woods for doing this. The root of this plant is nature's soap. That's right, it's a natural soap. Now one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to eat this. It needs a kind of yucca. Just letting you know. Well, nature does give us what we need. All we had to do was learn what to use, how to survive. Because everything around us has a purpose. We can show you what plant was food, which one was poison, which one you could rub on your skin and stop the bugs from biting you. There are many plants in Florida that can do that. Using nature, which gives us what we need. Everyone say flint napping. Flint. Learning to nap it is a real art. First, they would travel to the place where the best rocks could be found. Maybe even trade with the tribe who had the right of that quarry. 
And if that right, we might make a trade with them. And so we would then be able to collect the rocks and then carry them back to our village. After we broke them into the sizes we needed, the old men then would then spend time with the younger ones and teaching them how to nap and how to break on that rock and ship it to get it shaped the way they wanted. The art of flint napping. And so learning to chip that rock, hit it, break it. Another way of using uh, uh, doing this is uh, using antler. The deer antler is very strong. And when it's pushed onto the edge of that rock, it can break little flakes away. It can shape the rock basically the way we want it to be. If it gets dull, I can take the tool, the deer antler, and I can re-nap it. Now this one, I'll put it against this so you can see it. It's been napped out to a blade. It's kind of like a saw blade. So now it's not only razor sharp, but it's got a saw blade edge. So now we can cut through bone and anything that's in the way of course. Back then, this would be a knife, okay? This one I'm about to show you is a real old one. It's 2,000 years old. A little girl found this in her yard, and I went to her school to a program her family gave it to me as a gift so I could have it to show you. Because this girl found it in her yard, this is evidence that where she lives, native people live for thousands of years. And you know what, where you live today, they also live there too. Maybe that was a spot where they walked and hunted that deer they took a shot at. Maybe where you live was a place where we planted our crops, or we had a trail that went to our fishing spot. Everywhere you go in Florida, native people have already been. Our footprints were everywhere. Not just 500 years, thousands and thousands of years of living here and existence. Learning to break the rocks. We might make the rocks into knives. This one is a blade made of coral and a jawbone of an alligator for a handle. This one is also a coral blade and a deer's leg bone for the handle. But the most common blade made for a knife in Florida would have been an oyster shell. It's simple. It doesn't if it does break, there's plenty of them everywhere. So we can scrape it on a rock and get it sharp again. This one, we can also sharpen by re-napping it with a hammer. What about a tack? Everybody say tomahawk. These are tomahawks. These are made of flint rock. And the next two I'm going to show you are made of shell. And actually shell was a lot more common here in Florida than the rock. But I want you to know something. If I start chopping on these trees, there was any of them, they would break. We would have to use the help of something before just using these tomahawks. And that would be fire. Fire would be used on the wood before we chopped it. That made the wood softer and easier for chopping. If I have a big long log, instead of chopping it in half and spending all that energy, just lay it across the fire and burn it in half. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I were to bring down a big tree, I build a fire over here at the bottom if I wanted to fall this way. And so the fire would do the work and keep the fire from going up and mud and clay and keeping it wet and using a blowpipe to blow my hair just like a torch and we could make that tree come down. We could also use that fire to build a canoe. Everybody say dug out canoe. We called it dug out canoe because the center of the log was dug out using the tomahawk with the help of get it now? Now this is just a toy. The real canoe might be just 20 foot to 30 foot long. And if somebody would turn that stick and a little hair one way or the other, just bring it. <laughs> just one way or the other. Away from me, little bit. There you go, right here, perfect. This river right here has a name Hiplo in it. Hiplo. You ever heard that? Yeah? Well that word Hiplo means canoe. This was obviously a place where people came long ago gathered giant logs to build their big boats and canoes. This was a way of traveling, and native people were doing lots of it. From the islands in the Caribbean, across to Mexico with the Aztecs and the Mayans, trade was going on. We were carrying things from far away. Copper from the Great Lakes, obsidian from out west, shells from the east. These were valuable things if you didn't have them in your land, and so we could use them to make anything. But trading was something going on. Wherever you find these mound sites today in Florida, which is everywhere, that was places where the people were living and coming to. Back in those days, 
about 6,000 years ago, seeds have been trading all over and, and gardening had begun. This is what early tools for planting a garden would look like before John Deere showed up. This one's made out of what? Buffalo. It's a buffalo shoulder blade. Or how about shell or rock to use to make garden tools? Seeds like corn, beans, squash, potatoes, pumpkins, sunflowers, strawberries are just some of the plants we grow today in Florida that they were growing here back then. They learned to trade and the seeds went everywhere. In those days long ago, this is what the corn used to look like. It wasn't big like you have today, very small and different colors. And the corn would then be dried what we didn't eat in the summer. Drying this corn would harden it and any of the vegetables we had to dry if we're going to keep it. And in the winter time, we didn't have food in the garden because this dried food is what's going to get us through the winter, the spring until the new garden is ready to give us food again. And so drying of the food was very important. There would be big racks of corn hanging all over the place. And once it's hard, then we could store it. Everybody say gourd. This is nature's Tupperware, ladies, right here. All over the world, people use gourds as a way to store food or canteen or water, whatever. This one's got a top been taken off, so we can put the corn in there and seal it up. Then we use pre-sap glue. Fine pre-sap that gets on your cars. Well, it's got to use too, yep. We would collect it in a clay pot and get some ground up charcoal from the fire and sprinkle it in there once it's heated and the two fused together. There you go, guys. The J.D. Weld of the Caveman Day right there. And it is strong. We could seal that door to keep the food in there nice and dry to keep the bugs out and it would stay there until about maybe a half a year later when we're ready to use it. There would be a special building in the village up on stilts with smoky fires up under the house that filled the whole house up with smoke. The smoke house, keeping the bugs out, keeping it dry, very important. We're ready to use the dried food. We open the seal and dump it into some water and then we cook it. And that's how the food was dried. Long before the refrigerators were around, people had to dry the food. Everybody say pottery. Some of the oldest clay cooking pots in the United States are found in Florida along the St. John's River. Probably a connection between here and Mexico, and long ago that trade route coming here brought that idea into this part of the world. And so they learned to make the clay into pots, a pinch pots, oil pots, they learned to make it thin, add to decorations over time, and made lots of pottery. And so the clay pots, but before we had clay pots, they had rocks that they carved the soft stone, like soap stone out of, to make molds. But even before that, we think we took out of. How about an animal stomach? Or in this case, a piece of rawhide. This rawhide made into a bucket here when it gets wet. I'll fold it back up here, lace it back together, and you can hang food over the fire. All of your water inside it will burn. And so we can also use hot rocks, heat it in the fire, and picking them up with sticks. So you can touch them with your hand, you can dump them into the bucket, and you can cook food this way. And so ancient ways of cooking. People went to all extremes running these old ways. Everyone say drill. I want to show you how to drill. Put your hands together like that. There's a stick you clean. What are you doing? You're drilling. This next drill is known as a bow drill. It looks like a bow to shoot an arrow. It's not a, really for that purpose. The loose string wraps around the stick and the bow would work the stick back and forth. You'd have to push down on it with a shell or maybe a hard hickory nut to hold it in place, fire making bow. That's a rib bone of a small buffalo. The next drill I'm going to show you is the pump drill. Everybody say pump drill. All over the world, this drill goes back to about 2,000 years ago. As I push down, it begins to spin back and forth. The round thing at the bottom is a counterweight. It keeps it spinning. So all I do is push down and let off, and it winds itself right back up. Thank you to that big round counterweight. At the very bottom is the drill bit. The drill bit is made out of a piece of flint, just like the arrowheads and things earlier. And if I didn't like this size, we could take it right off and put a different size on there. That's called socketing. Say that, socketing. You got a socket wrench? That's where that idea comes from, right there, socketing. 
It says the people long ago drilled holes poles and shells, making beautiful jewelry and beads, and carvings were done on the shells that told who are we, what family we are, what nation we are, and making the marks on shells we would use things like starch, teeth, or in this case, a jawbone of a beaver, holding it just like you might hold a pencil, and the artist would sit there hour after hour, scratching on that shell to make the mark. And then paint, like the paint I'm wearing today. And by the way, we wore paint for lots of reasons. The hunter's camouflage, the fisherman's sun bucket, and of course the battlefield. We wore to scare enemies today. It's for picture paint. Take them all. There you go. But we would take that paint and rub it into that shell, making the mark that you see there now. And this would be like an identification badge. Kind of tell who you are, what family you belong to. So shells like that. And in the east, we had plenty of shells all over the place. So we talked a little bit about this here, farming. And let's talk a little bit about fishing. You guys like to go fishing? Check out this fish trap right here. It's made out of grapevine. We take this down to the river and uh, set it out there in the middle of a creek. We might take some rocks, put one on the back so it won't float away, and then we'll take a bunch of rocks and build them like a wall. The wall would guide the fish right here inside the trap. Now once the fish go in there, sharp spikes facing in keep them from turning around and just coming right out. Because once they turn around, now the spikes are looking right into their eyeballs. So it keeps the fish in there. This is only a small fish trap. Some of them were 10 foot long. Take the fish out, the inner basket can be untied and open it right up. Another way to catch the fish would be to use a spear. Everybody say jigging. Check out this fish jig. It pops loose and that fish takes off swimming, trying to get away. I'm going to let him swim a while, but if I go pull him on the rope, it'll rip right out. Pull up that fish swim, and everywhere the fish goes, guess what's following the fish? A float. In this case, another gourd. Whenever I see that float's not moving anymore, well, we better hurry up to get that fish before that big alligator there does. Yeah, he is real. 13 foot, 4 inches long. He came out of Lake Okeechobee. Now we also fished with hooks. I want to show you a couple of our fish hooks. The first two here are carved out of alligator bone. And the next one, well, there's some of that tree sap blue, the black stuff hanging there. That's made out of bone. And the one that's got animal hair is actually carved out of shell. You gotta look real close because it's being disguised with the animal hair. I'll walk them over here so everybody gets a chance to see them. And you notice there's no fishing pole. Back then, we didn't have fishing poles. We tied these strings on the tree branches and roots sticking out of the banks of the river. And we would leave them there, the bait on there. And hopefully, when we come back next day, we'll have lots of fish on all of our hooks. So we've had many hooks out at the same time. So they're here in the United States. What I'm holding in my hand is the deer skin. We can leave the hair on to make a rug or we can scrape the hair off. Animal hair would get used to make things like the disguise for that fish hook, or we might use it to make a blowgun dart for shooting out the blowgun. Maybe I'll show it to you later. The headdress I'm wearing today is also made of animal hair. The deer hair dyed red, the beard of the turkey, and the hair of the, the animal that was brought to our land, the horse. Maybe I'll take that skin and dry it stiff in the sun. Everybody say rawhide. This is like the drum that you heard playing earlier. And later today we'll have more dancing. The big drum is made of rawhide. No different than a dog chew bone you might buy in the store for a dog to chew on. Rawhide. Soak it in water. It gets soft and easy to make stuff with. Right now, hard and stiff. Sun. I can also take that same hide and make very soft leather like the leggings and shoes on my feet. These leathers this way, it's just known as brain can. Everybody say brain can. It's animal brain to tan the hide. The word tanning comes from something that's inside the brain. Tannins. Acorns also have tannins. You can use acorns to tan a hide. If you're gonna use acorns to make flour, you gotta wash out the tannins. They're like poison. It's what makes the river out here brown, is the tannins of the plants. And also there's a lot of pollution there too. But anyways, tannins. And that's where the word tanning the hide. Every animal had enough brain in the head to tan his own skin. 
step on him. Steel. On the alligator back are little bones. Those bones are known as scoop. They make very good buttons and they protect the back of the alligator and make good steel. Maybe I'll take that alligator's tail and I'll cut off the meat inside. Oops. And we'll eat it. Anybody ever try alligator? Tastes like a um, crocodile. Yeah. The tail, it tastes the whole thing like arrows, or in this case, how about a sword made from the nose of a swordfish? Yeah. Maybe I'll take that alligator's foot and I'll make myself a pocket. What's in your wallet? Mine makes the back scratch. Take the mosquitoes in the wall. The best part of the alligator is when you squeeze out all of the juices. You guys like Gatorade, don't you? All right then. Well, anyway, just joking about that. Uh, we didn't waste anything from the animals, but we killed them. We honored them and used all of them. Imagine a turtle shell as your bowl for eating out of tonight, or a drinking cup made of a shell. Now you're starting to see how these old tribes live, how they survive. Now I want to show you the weaponry. Would you like to see them? The oldest weapons go way back in time to the earliest people in the world, and those were simple weapons like these noggin knockers I've got right here. Yeah, these beating sticks. And even though natives like their weapons like this, even up until the time we got guns, we were still using and carrying the old war clubs around. So these were the earliest weapons of man all over the world, beating sticks. And then somebody invented a new stick. It wasn't for beating, it was for stabbing the spear. And then time went on, and the smart people showed up. They said, take those rocks over there and break them sharp. And time onto that bone of the animal, make it fit or sock it right on the end there. And that's how that started. And then one day, everyone was up there stabbing on the animal, but the smart people were back there going with their stick and doing what? Growing. Aren't you glad your ancestors were the smart people? Yeah. The others were going, why didn't we think of that? Anyways, as time went on, the spear started changing from a stabbing spear to a throwing spear. And the throwing spear is going to be a lot lighter. And this weapon's going to change all over the world, all at the same time, the changing of this weapon. The spear now has become lighter, better for flying. Lightweight river cane, which grew all over the United States. River cane, our native plant, not bamboo. That was brought here by the Spanish. Feathers make arrows fly straight. And the way these feathers are curved, that's going to make that arrow spin. This idea of a spinning arrow later will lead to a bullet spinning from a gun in rifling. The arrowhead's not going to be big and giant. We're going to start making them small. So they come and go deeper into the animal. Whenever we would throw this, this would stick into the animal and stay, and this would fall to the ground. The hunter can then pick this up, and inside your pocket or pouch, have a whole bunch of these arrowheads. Add a new one and use it again. If I throw an arrow as hard as I can, see that guy trying to get away? Watch this. Just kidding. If I want an arrow to go far, then I gotta make my arm longer. So this next invention is in the archaic time. Everyone say paddle paddle. The addle paddle. Say it. Addle paddle. There you go. Now the addle paddle was all over the world, but this device came from a simple tree branch like the one I have. And as time went on, they learned to utilize it into a very formidable weapon. Learning to use that as the long arm, making your arm very long for throwing the arrow. And as time goes, they learn to make it thin so it will bend. And as people learn to bend that piece of wood, where it doesn't break, a new weapon is going to come. Anybody know what it's called? A bow. That's right, the bow and arrow. And all over the world, people have it. Now, the bow can shoot an arrow a lot farther than the old addle addle, but the arrow's not going to stay big and long like this. As time goes, it's going to get small. Here's one with a shark tooth as an arrow bed as we would have definitely had here in Florida. And so the bow can shoot an arrow and it doesn't stay big like this anymore. Now the bow doesn't become a weapon until the end of the ice age when the earth begins to warm and 
the gardening begins and farming begins and bow becomes the weapon. Big animals like the woolly mammoths are gone. And now we're going to hunt the deer. And one of the ways of hunting that deer was our tribe would dress the best shooter up, who's the best shooter, as a deer. He's going to have his bow and he's going to have his arrows underneath the coat of the deer. The face of the deer would be made into a mask allowing the hunter to get in very close to get that accurate shot with his bow. Even though the bow could shoot an arrow out of sight almost, it wasn't accurate out of sight like that. He had to get close to get that good shot. The arrowheads were much smaller by the bow. And this will be the weapon that natives were using as the arrival of Europeans here in this land, the bow. Now, as they come, it's very scary. Who are these strangers who have marched into our world? And as they come, they bring things we've never seen, like guns, metal tools, horses, pigs, goats, cows, sheep. These are all animals that will be brought here to this land. Who are these strangers wearing this cooking pot on their head? I guess that's what it is, huh? <laughs> Anyways, as they arrived, at first it was a village on the east side of Florida, everyone say Chief Saloy. Chief Saloy. Today you might know that village as St. Augustine. Okay? And then there was more of them that was spread about. And uh, these were the old tribes that lived in Florida when they arrived. Most of these tribes were pretty much wiped out by the 1700s. Very few of them remained. Lots of them merged with other tribes. Many of them became part of the Spanish in St. Augustine. When the Spanish turned Florida over to the British in the Revolutionary War days, they left with them, uh, the tribes left with the Spanish and went to islands like Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico. And so the British had bought trading posts for our villages and lots of trade goods. As we saw these trade goods, we had to give them something. In the old days, it was the knowledge the native people had of sports. And so they would need our help. But then knowledge wasn't needed as much. The furs and animal skins that blew down back here were very valuable across the ocean. And that was money as well. If you've ever heard of your money called bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, well, two of them blew down. They're real bucks. And that's how you got that name for your money. If I have enough deer skins, I could buy anything you see on this table over here. To buy a metal axe, maybe three or four deer skins. To buy a gun, now we're talking 30 to 50 deer skins. If I want some of their cloth and these beautiful beads and these metal cooking pots, check out this ye old colonial Nike here. What about the looking glass? And just a handful of nails would have been so valuable in our villages long ago. The old way to make a fire was to rub sticks together. But we learned about this new thing, the striker. It worked just like some of the old guns did back then, the flintlock. A piece of flint and steel, strike and make a spark. Collecting the spark on some burnt cloth and using some dead moss I found on the ground around here to make the fire. No one needs to rub sticks together now. All we need now is to strike a piece of flint and steel, a trade good. And as time goes on, Trade our way of life. Thanks for joining me on another aimless adventure. If you enjoy videos like this, please subscribe and feel free to leave a comment. Until next time, adventure on.